Hello, my name is Govinda Singh. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who also works here at Regen Rehab. The topic that I've been uh, asked to talk about is actually, can we reverse arthritis? To do this, I'd like to explain a little bit about arthritis first, what it is, and then how to go about trying to reverse this problem. So I'll put some slides on first. So bear with me, it's just coming up now. Right, that's me. And we'll go to the next slide. So what is arthritis? Now in arthritis, when we talk about arthritis normally, we talk about osteoarthritis, also known as wear and tear arthritis or genetic related arthritis. The Americans tend to call it osteoarthrosis, but this is OA or osteoarthritis. The other common arthritis I've also talked about, or you know about our rheumatoid arthritis, which is the autoimmune problem where people get very early and very terrible deformities. That's not what we're focusing on, on today. The other common arthritis that you would have heard about is gout, uh, which is a uric acid problem. You have an inborn error of metabolism where you cannot cope with the amount of uh, proteins in specific purines and pyrimidines and uh, you develop uric acid. Septic arthritis is when there's infection in a joint. Psoriatic arthritis is when you have psoriasis or other inflammatory skin disease. Sometimes that autoimmune component of that can cause arthritis in a joint as well. SARA is one of the many names for sexually transmitted um, regional arthritis, but let's not worry about that. I'm going to focus today on osteoarthritis. Now, what are the causes of osteoarthritis? The commonest, which we all know about, is idiopathic or primary, which means that we don't really know what causes it. Idiopathic just means that we don't know the cause. It is the common wear and tear of aging arthritis that we talk about. OA can also be after an accident, post-traumatic arthritis, when there's damage to a joint. You can have it after an inflammatory arthritis is burnt out when the arthritis is finished. Then you can end up with leftover changes in the joint, which cause secondary osteoarthritis. You can likewise have secondary after gout or an infection, or if you've got uh, things like slipped capital femoral epiphysis, which is a childhood disease, or osteonecrosis, which, which is an unusual disease where there's not enough blood going to the bone. But really, by and large, we're talking about OA, or osteoarthritis, primary osteoarthritis. Now, this is a very simple diagram of a joint. You will see here, you have the two ends of the bone covered by this black line, which is a capsule or a thick sleeve. Between the two ends of the bone is what I've drawn out here with a red outline, is the cartilage. What is a cartilage? The cartilage is a white shiny surface, which you'll find at the end of a bone. Now, if you eat chicken or whatever, if you eat a drumstick, you'll find the white shiny cartilage at the end of it. This is a unique substance, which is very slippery, very hard wearing and very shock resilient. And we develop problems when this cartilage is damaged. Damage to the cartilage really and truly is the beginning of osteoarthritis. The type of cartilage we have in osteoarthritis is hyaline cartilage, which caps the ends of the bone. It is nourished by synovial fluid and there's very poor nourishment really to this cartilage, except through the synovial fluid. It, there's not much blood supply to it. In fact, there's no blood supply to it. And yet, in spite of having this poor nutrition, it really does last for a very, very long time. Don't worry about the rest of this. This is more technical. 
So what is the function of the cartilage? It helps to make the joint surface a bit broader and therefore spreads the load. Just by walking, we can have six times our body weight going through our knee, for example. And uh, in running, we can have 20 times body weight. The important thing to note is the low friction surface. It's a unique substance which has low friction and high resilience. It lasts for a long time and it is low friction, so there's very little wear. Now, what happens in OA or osteoarthritis is you get some destruction and some regeneration of cartilage, but this is unregulated. So the cartilage doesn't shine as easily. It looks funny, it looks flaky. Um, it's, you have fissuring, you get little cracks in it, and the cartilage becomes thin and gets lost. When this happens, this is what we call advanced osteoarthritis. Now, these are images on the left of a normal looking knee at the time of arthroscopy. You can see when I put the probe in, that metal uh, uh, instrument in, I can't push it in. It looks nice and shiny and white and resilient. On the right, you will see the image of softening cartilage. When, when the cartilage softens, I can easily put the probe in, so it's weak. And that's not a good situation. This, is, of course, is much worse at a, at a higher stage where you can see that cartilage begins to flake off. And in fact, there's a huge area here where there's no cartilage, and you can see the bone shining through. In this stage, we need to do something about it. Um, I think we can skip the actual pathology of this. Basically, you get all sorts of bad things happening, including osteophytes, also known as bone spurs. The cartilage then wears away and we can get cyst formation. And on an X-ray, you see, we see typical radiological findings, the most important of which is loss of joint space. When somebody stands up, there's nothing preventing the bones from touching each other. Now, we grade it on an x-ray from grade zero, of course, which is completely normal. Although more often someone comes to you and says, I've got a bit of pain, and then you do an x-ray and it looks pretty normal, and that's grade one. All the way down to grade four, when it's terrible osteoarthritis, which really you need to do a knee replacement for. The kelgren lorenz scale on an x-ray is what we use. This is an example of grade four osteoarthritis in the knee. The top bone is the femur. The bottom bone is the cartilage. You should normally have some good cartilage as you can see here on the left of the bone, but on the right, there's no space because the cartilage is all worn away and bone is rubbing on bone. In this situation, there's nothing left but a knee replacement. So, my problem is, as an orthopedic surgeon, I can, I, can, uh, I can then go back to show you, or I can do surgery when the surgery is very bad. But when the arthritis is very bad, it's easy to do arthritis, uh, to do surgery, to do a joint replacement. But what do I do when the patient is younger? or the arthritis is not so bad. In a very young patient who has pain in the knee, often it's because of a tear of soft tissue, such as a meniscus. In a very old patient who's got severe wear in the knee, it's an easy procedure to say, it's an easy diagnosis to say that you've got severe wear and you need a knee replacement. But what do we do for the in-between crowd? And that's where I got interested in looking at biological options. How do we reverse this osteoarthritis so a patient can get by without joint replacement surgery? Ideally, this is for grade two and grade three osteoarthritis. Now, the American College of Rheumatology says that everybody who has OA or osteoarthritis should be educated on their problems and need support. We should have weight loss, exercise programs, physiotherapy, and possibly occupational therapy. There are four classical operations for arthritis. I'm just going to briefly talk about them. 
osteotomy or cutting the bone and realigning it. You can see that there's a cut in the top of the bone here and it's being realigned using an external fixator or an aerial type arrangement. You can do a fusion or arthrodesis. This is an ankle joint which has been fused for osteoarthritis. You can do a joint replacement. And joint replacement, for example, this is an old fashioned knee operation where we open up the knee widely and replace all the worn parts. I'll skip that gory, gory detail. So there's many choices, but we don't have a good choice or we did not have a good choice for a younger patient. And I mean, under the age of 65 or with not so bad arthritis, but with enough troubling arthritis. So now we have another choice. Now, I'll just detail that very quickly. If you've got grade two or grade three osteoarthritis, which is the type of patient we're looking at, certain supplements can help. Lots of people are taking glucosamine with or without chondroitin. Type two collagen has become uh, popular recently. Piasclidine, which is a tablet made out, made from soya and, uh, and avocado oil has been useful injections into the knee of visco supplements and prp or platelet rich plasma have become um, interestingly looked at but really the thing that makes all the difference in my opinion is mesenchymal stem cells in a sense what you can say is we age because we don't regenerate wearing out tissue that wears out so the way to regenerate it normally is using our own body stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells. And part of the reason we age, not all the whole reason, but part of the reason we age is that our stem cells are not good enough anymore to replace the parts that are wearing out. Let's go back and talk about briefly these visco supplements. There's many names for them, also known as lubricant injections. They provide a fresh lubricating fluid layer into a knee or other joint and may help reduce degradation enzymes. And it also helps cartilage. PRP is something that I've used for many years. I was one of the early users of PRP in this country. And it's a platelet rich centrifuge of your own blood. Take some of your own blood, spin it down, use a part that's rich in platelets and inject it into the injured area. Um, it's full of growth factors. Um, there's a whole uh, alphabet of these factors. And it's been well proven in extra articulatories, which means outside the joint or in a ligament that's attached to a part that's outside the joint. The proof of it in osteoarthritis is not so good, however. Now let's go back to our famous MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, or commonly known as stem cells. They are pluripotential cells. That means that they have the chance of changing into whatever is necessary. The sources can be our own cells, which is the way we get them normally. Um, when we age, our body produces stem cells from bone marrow. We can also get them from fat. We can use donated cells with allogenic cells, which can be from an adult from the umbilical cord of a baby. This is not the same as cord blood. Cord blood gives you blood, but there's an area of the umbilical cord called Wharton's jelly, which produces pure mesenchymal stem cells. Um, you can get them from a fetus, which of course we don't do because number one is unethical and number two, you can have problems with overgrowth with fetal cells. And finally, there is xenograft, which is tissue from a different species. And this is both fetuses and xenografts are strongly discouraged and in fact not allowed in Malaysia. So what we're talking about is allogenic, which is what I use most of all. Allogenic meaning donated tissue from Wharton's jelly. Why do I do use allogenic rather than the patient's own stem cells? The reason is my scientists who work in the lab tell me that if you take stem cells from the bone marrow of a patient who is 50 years old and above, it is very difficult to grow them. 
and the, these cells don't multiply easily. And that, as I said, may be a reason why we age. So I use these young cells, very active cells from Wharton's jelly, and uh, they work wonderfully. So how it works, we see the patient, I do a history, I assess the patient, I do an x-rays, and if suitable, I may offer the MSC, or mesenchymal stem cells. Sometimes, in certain instances, they may need surgery before the cells are done. This is for very specific indications, and we will talk to that on a one-to-one -one basis. But the way it happens if we need to do an injection is that one injection is done in the center, in the region rehab hospital, with prior arrangements from the stem cell lab to get these cells ready. Because the lab, as I've said, have grown these cells from a small number of cells to many, many millions. These millions of cells are then frozen and await use. When I need them, they're thawed and then sent to me so I can use them. So what have I done? I've done in excess of 400 knees and some other joints as well, but mainly in knees. Now, of all these patients, 5% very honestly have told me or do not have any improvement whatsoever. That leaves 90 95% who have improved. There's a various range of level of improvement. Some of them have come to me and said, doctor, it's like a miracle. I'm back to normal. And some of them say, doctor, it's better than anything else I've had, but it's not quite a miracle. The typical patient will improve by three or four points on the pain scale. If you look at a 10 point scale, so a pain score of six or seven out of 10, which is very significant, is often reduced to a pain score of three out of 10, which is not so significant and very manageable. If you have a pain score of five, you may come down to one or two, which is almost nothing. It's interestingly enough, after I give an injection of stem cells, you probably don't feel much of an improvement for six to 12 weeks, that is up to three months. But then the improvement kicks in as these stem cells do their work, both changing into cartilage cells to patch up the area, as well as stimulating your own body to grow cartilage, which normally it does not do. And this keeps improving month by month for two years. And your pain relief may last for five or more years, typically. Now, I'll just end this um, images. And we'll come back to looking at what else we can do. Now, in general, MSCs or mesenchymal stem cell therapy is a very useful thing to do, but it's not something I do in isolation. I advise everybody to take a supplement, which works for some people and not for everyone, but you take whatever supplement is useful to you. Other things we should do, physiotherapy, rehab, which we have a very good center here in region rehab. Weight loss is important for those who have osteoarthritis. I'm not just throwing that out. There's good studies to show that if you lose 5% body weight, you have a clinically significant improvement in pain for osteoarthritis with no other treatment, just 5% body weight. So if you're really big and weigh 100 kilos, we're talking about five kilos weight loss. Of course, the more you lose after that, the better you get. And this is without any other treatment. If, of course, you have other treatment on top of that, it helps even more. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for listening.